Ladies and gentlemen, could I have your attention for just 30 seconds, I promise. Could I have your attention for 30 seconds, please? Please, a drum roll, please. This is very high. Oh. See, the reason there has been this little delay. Oh, I see Pat Buttram, George Greeley, Tony Caruta. I, I'm seeing all of my favorite. And there's my, come over here, Bobby. Come over here. Come over. And Michelle, please, this is Bobby Jr. This is Bobby, who is Bob Cummings, 1990. Look at that smile. Give us that smile, Bobby. <laughs> and Michelle, come over here, honey. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason this started a little late... Hi, Mr. DeFore. Nice to see you. The reason it started a little late is because Mr. Cummings uh, had called me as... Oh, I see Terry. Well, I see... God, I'm seeing everybody. Uh, is because Mr. Cummings believes that he is going to dinner... I, th I sound like Ralph Edwards, don't I? For a moment, for a moment, <laughs> Betty. He thinks that he's going to dinner with us uh, uh, in, uh, uh, at a quarter to eight. And Bob, dear Bob, who knows what a nervous guy I am, uh, he called and we went on the phone and he's been giving me some advice about how I should get some rest. Because he knows, Jane, Jane Withers, he knows that just 45 minutes ago, my beard was very thick. You could see the perspiration. Hi, Pat Buttram. You could, you could see the perspiration, and it's because I was up all night uh, writing, and for a guy who didn't go to school, Michelle, that's something, writing the introductions when I learned, hi, John Cadell, when I learned just that all of you are going to be here. Now, the, the thing I want to say is, Bob knows nothing about this, he believes that he's going to dinner, and I shared something with him. I said, Bob, and I was crying at the time, but I was crying because of all of the messages that I've received and what I knew was going to be happening tonight. I said, Bob, thank you for the honor tonight, the night before your birthday, for allowing this little guy to have a private birthday party with you. And I said, I will never forget this private birthday party, how you honored me. And when he sees all of you, and I'm just a little nervous because you're all of his favorites, those phone calls that I made personally, that was because Bob that day was telling me so a wonderful story about about you at the time, and I said, oh my God, there's someone else, then someone else, then, and it wasn't until two days ago, Bobby, that I found out that, that Red Buttons and he were very close, even though they worked together, Red will be here a little later on, so he was only called three days ago, we had to do it this way. At any rate, you're going to give him a great night, I promise you that you're in for some wonderful surprises. I'm uplifted and edified, I see Art Linkletter, you know, Art, uh, one of the things that we know, your background, your entire background, to me, now my name is Jimmy Caesar, to me the greatest thing I ever saw you do was a film where you showed your comedic talent with Ronald Coleman, Celeste Holm, Vincent Price. It was a movie called Champagne for Caesar. I wonder why I remember the title so well. <laughs> At any rate, I'm delighted you're all here. I'm going to disappear in a moment to go over and, and Bob knows that I'm usually about five minutes late, but I said I won't be late tonight. So I'll be walking him over here. Thank you for coming. David Guest, who is probably, and I'm going to quote the words of the beloved late Ruth Burl, she said there has never been anyone in Hollywood who has been able to put together the parties that David Guest does, as we all know from the Cinema Awards, and Jane Withers was, was acknowledging also. David Guest, thank you for your help in getting a lot of this together. Marvin Page, thank you. Alan Jones, thank you for the phone numbers. And I promise I won't use these phone numbers after this week. <laughs> Bless you all. We'll see you all in a little while. Thank you so much. Thank you. Alan Jones photographed me. Look at this. There was a photographer in front of me as I was talking, and I was saying, gee, they're photographing me. Then the camera came down, and it was Alan Jones. 
the one, the only, Ellen, would you wish a little happy birthday to Bob? He'll see this on tape. Oh, you have already? And several, God, it's nice to see you. God, at any rate, have a good time. And hi, Jack. God, oh, God, this is their body heart. God, I'm seeing. Have a real nice evening. I know that. And I see Dwayne Hickman. Dwayne, good to see you. And Joni, good to see you. By the way, the musicians who are performing tonight are doing this out of love. Out of love. They are not asking for any money. The musical director... And so, if Bob doesn't shake hands the way he normally does, please take into consideration, and I hope that everyone that is hearing me will pass the word on to the next person, that hi, Roberta Sherwood, and I see Rosemary. Hi, Rose. Good to see you. Good to love you, honey. So, that's the way it's That's why they are Very happy birthday, Bob. Very, and many more, many more. Thank you. I called you before. I called you. I heard the messages.
photographer over here. Uh, we need this photographer. Stinky! We got a photographer here, Bob.
drummer shot. One more rejection you got That's okay. <laughs> I love rejection. I love rejection. <laughs>
Detectives, there's Psychopaths, there's Nymphomaniacs. I said, well, I can show you everything here in this room. This is a Freudian museum. I sure did. He's recording all this and it goes on a late, late show.
thank God. Such a good looking guy, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Of course, everybody wants to be a <laughs> great comedian. Yeah. 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 I was I still are.
and it's not the fault of the lovely, lovely, uh, the lovely girls. A drum roll. Good. Thank you, Sid. A drum roll. <laughs> Look, that was disappearing. Wouldn't you know we catch the poor guy as he's going to A nice drum roll. <laughs> This is Walter Cronkite welcoming you to a wonderful, wonderful evening. Here. I think the mic is working. You guys are around here. Never put a microphone in front of a hand. And it's times like this I wish I were Dick Cabot because I can't find the words to truly express. Ladies and gentlemen, Sid, 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 please, would you do me a favor? Some of the people have hearing aids and I'm not trying to be loud for their sake. And you're telling me you can't hear me. <laughs> well, earlier right now and join in wishing a very happy, happy birthday to, from the words of Del Charbet in the song that was your theme, to a most romantic guy in the beginning of, well, the, the end of his it's the eighth, eighth decade because then it becomes, wow, wow. By the way, George Burns has a message you're going to hear that. I don't want to do the line that he said in his message. At any rate, can we bring the cake out now? Is it possible? On the way. It's on the way. Good. You know what they told me? Art, what they told me, they said, Jimmy, you better get out there. I was sneaking over to the place to get something that I forgot, and that's the message is that dear buddy is going to read, and I said, they're at my apartment, and as I started to walk out, Bob, they said, no, Jimmy, it's time for the cake, so I'm on stage right now. Is it going to be shortly? Let me have an arpeggio. Just an arpeggio. A romantic guy, I Hale and hearty guy I am, so high in the sky that each passerby must know that you are the reason why. Bob, everybody here wishes to let you know the love that they have for you. I wish I could have shared some of the personal conversations when I spoke to most everybody that's in this room tonight. And a couple of others are going to be coming in a little later, and they said, we're going to leave that other one. We've got to be with Bob tonight. They said things, the word that kept coming up, and it's amazing, uh, they always say, isn't he funny? Isn't he funny, that wonderful subtle wit that he has when talking? But every one of them said the same word, and that was his kindness. Barbara Hale, so magnificently in her message. Um, by the way, my wife did something quite interesting. There were about 10 messages. Uh, Jamie knows about this because we, we kind of, she's been working quietly. And Bob's probably been wondering, where has Jamie been going all this time? And he'd call and say, is Jamie over there? Is that, and this is what was going on this last, this last four months, actually. Uh, the, I, would you believe I forgot what I was talking about? But it makes the difference. What was I talking about? <laughs> well, where are we? It just shows you. See, that's called, I don't know what it's called, but it, uh, Dale Nelson, good to, Dale flew down, by the way, from, from, oh, I know what I was starting to say, Dale. Several people had to send their message uh, by the telephone uh, because neither my wife or I might have been home at that moment. I'll just tell you some of the messages because we recorded them, Bob, and to one cassette, so you'll hear them, you'll hear a most charming message from Barbara Hale, who just was devastated that she couldn't be here. We have messages from Donald O'Connor, from Peggy Ryan, from, uh, gee, there's a bunch of them. Uh, my wife, uh, uh, this is Gregory. <laughs> my, my, young man, must you keep talking so? So at any rate, I better guess, Mr. Peck, I'm sorry, I just never had a microphone before. Well? Proceed. At any rate, we now welcome. Oh, the cake is here. <laughs> I think there should be candles, shouldn't there? 
Unless maybe things have changed. We're in a new world today, Terry. If I ever hand a kiss at you, I will tell you, young man, you are very confused. Very, very confused. And it's so at every date. What could I tell you? Nancy, please, Nancy. We will then send her. We're doing a show now. We're doing a show. At any rate, somebody bailed me out. What's happening? Hotel during the 50s, the conductor and the band leader at the Roosevelt, Mr. Jack Nye. Let's move on the keyboard over there. He played for just about everyone from Judy Garland to <laughs> Maurice Chevalier, because I have that tape and that's very precious to me. Seated behind him, also doing this for love. Believe me, and I look at a musician like Mr. George Greeley, who was the uh, man who wrote, conducted, uh, and, and did all the music for the series, the entire series, My Living Doll. And, and George Greeley, how good to see you, George. To see your fellow musicians here. I, I have a feeling... the drums, one of the finest drummers, uh, has worked with just about everybody. This is Mr. Pat Moran, ladies and gentlemen, at the drums. One of the big bands. And seated behind me, playing the guitar and entertaining so, and if you ever see his name advertised in Palm Springs or anywhere, you're in for a treat because you ought to see the entertainment he provides. He's so special. This is Vic Faniello, ladies and gentlemen. So, we invite everyone to, to have a good, good time. Bob, again, happy birthday. And we're going to have a little program in just a moment. It's going to be very short because we know that a couple of people have to leave. I must beg, uh, if, uh, if I know that, that many people have to leave right now, but if there's a possibility of remaining just a little longer, there's some kind of special words that, that will be said. So we'll let you enjoy the cake and, and receive the cake, and then we'll have the short little program. Thank you. So David, guess how good meeting you. God, this is the man that really knows how to put on a party. David, so honored to have you with us. So honored to have you with us. Thank you. Gentlemen, uh, because and I know 
and I've kind of held this up, but it's because I couldn't get back to the apartment. I would like to invite on stage at this moment uh, to deliver two messages to you, Bob, that were delivered. These are personal notes delivered. Uh, well, one was delivered about five days ago, and one was delivered today. But I'd like to call upon the man who, by God, need we say more, Mr. Buddy Rogers, ladies and gentlemen. Buddy, thank you. Bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Glad to be with you, Bob, tonight. Oh, I'm so much older than you are. Huh? They say old actors never die, they just lose their parts. <laughs> Thank God we haven't lost our parts. Uh, I'm so happy to be here with you. Uh, I'm going to read something. Yes. You think I can read? Yes. Oh, let's uh, This is special. The wine house. Dear Mr. Cummings, happy 80th birthday. Barbara and I hope your day is filled with the warmth of good friends and the glow of happy memories. You have our best wishes on this special, special occasion. Sincerely, the President of the United States. I just want to say something. No, you said it perfectly. He signed it, George. He signed it, George. Dear Bob, happy birthday. Nancy and I want you to know that our thoughts are with you on this very special day. We hope that you will celebrate this joyous occasion with every happiness and good cheer. May the coming year bring more of the same and may all of your wishes come true. Congratulations, Bob, and many, many, many happy returns of the day. It says Ron, but you know that means the <laughs> next president of the United States, Ron Reagan. years ago and I tried to produce a picture and you had a great cast Bob, Claudette Colbert, Donna Meach and yourself. And I lost a lot of money on but I still love you. I lost money. So happy to be here. Aren't we all happy to be here on yeah. this first day? Jimmy? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Buddy Rogers, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Buddy Rogers. Love you, Buddy. You know, you know what is wonderful about Buddy? Uh, Buddy must bring about 20 shows a year over to uh, the Veterans Hospital. He asks his friends such as Danny Thomas, Milton Berle, uh, Red Buttons, who was here a moment ago, and just about every one of our top names. And the shows, Buddy, that you bring to the veterans every, every, I think it's about every three months, and it's never publicized, but the veterans know it, and I for one know it because I'm usually uh, kind of going along because I love to see these fine entertainers. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Buddy Rogers. Thank you. Forgive me if I read some notes, because I had to write these things. Well, I didn't write them. I had the help of Marty Farrell, who was one of the three writers of the Oscar this year. Where is Marty sitting? Marty, that's Marty Farrell, ladies and gentlemen. Great comedy writer. Since Bob's career covered both movies and television, the gentleman I'm about to introduce is a perfect guest to tonight's roster. He is one of the first presidents of the Television Academy, and his many films included a really great one with our guest of honor. Don, we're really glad you came along. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Don DeFore. Thank you very much. Robert, Uncle Bob. I want you to 
how pleased Mary and I are, are to be here tonight. It's a great happy birthday. We love you. I have some fond memories of that great picture. I think one of the best war pictures it's made. Yes. During, yes. we know she's not in the best of health. We had Helen Forrest here, and I didn't tell you this, Don, and I certainly didn't tell Bob because he didn't even know this was going to happen. At this point, after you spoke, I was going to bring the microphone over to Helen Forrest, and she was going to sing the song that she performed in the film, You Came Along. Now, is Patty Andrews still here? Is Patty here? She's in here. Well, then, you came along from out of nowhere, leading me to a memory. Beautiful schemes, beautiful dreams out of nowhere. This is James Mason, my man. Will you please continue introducing the people you're sickening? At any rate, God, that, that makes me, I watched that movie, I swear, Don, and Uncle Bob knows this, my daughters, we, we have a copy of the film and I've made copies for several people. I watched the movie and at that scene when you're afraid to tell your buddy that he has, that he has a, a, a terminal illness and that he's not going to be with us long, I cry, I cry and... Sometimes Bob calls me at that. Don, would you come up here? I must tell a good, <laughs> an amusing story. Great, great. Mary and I happened to be in New York, and uh, we're in the elevator one day, and the producer of um, the Italian version Watch it. of you. <laughs> and the fellow said, do you know Mr. Cummings? And I said, well, Tim, I did the picture too. He said, would you know? He has an unusual manner of speaking. He would go to say something, and then he doesn't say it. <laughs> and then he goes to say something, and he doesn't say it. And he said, you know that the man who dubbed Robert Cummings' voice went to the hospital, and the second man we had was on the verge of it. And I said, well, i got to tell you something. This man has become a great star in our town because of that very great manners. <laughs> no one has ever been able to start a sentence with that's right. That was a good one, was a... And it's great. Bob, it was, it was a great attribute, and you did it in all your pictures. So God bless you. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you know, Don, what, what, what you just said, and this is a true story, and I promise I'll make this short. I stuttered very badly as a child. I'm one of 17 children. I was the 16th. Uh, my father was a producer. That's why I'm in Hollywood. You know. My mother was a producer. Papa directed a little. But I could never say one sentence. In, I, 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 I stuttered very badly. Then I went to sing King's Row. And I came home without stuttering, talking as Bob Cummings done. And I know just the thing you're talking about. See, now you hear me stutter when I, this is the Bob that you're, well, I feel, well, Chuck, Margaret, yes. You know that wonderful pause. Great, Bob. We have, I looked over to the side over here and, and I saw, first of all, before I introduce this man uh, uh, to say a few words, uh, I noticed my Italian Kumbani, because my real name, I'm an Italian boy from Buffalo, one of the truly, well, I think he's the last remaining screen tough guy from that golden era. I'm speaking of, whether it's with a gun or with a tomahawk, it's always a superb performance. Mr. Anthony Caruso, ladies and gentlemen. Love you, Tony. Love you. Forgive me. I have to do one impression for him. Your best friend, 
Alan Ladd. I do Alan Ladd. I can never do it in my act because nobody knows who I'm doing, but I'm going to do Alan Ladd. You pull around on me. I'm a tongue. <laughs> you pull around on me. I'm <laughs> But remember when he played in that Chinese movie where he played the Chinese fellow and he said, Ming Toy. <laughs> you pull around on me. I'm <laughs> I had to do it for you, Tony. He's the star. We see it in reruns of one of the very best series that television ever presented. Show called Eight is Enough. We know him from the Broadway appearances. He goes as far back as I remember Mama as the youngest boy. And I think that was live television in those days. Ladies and gentlemen, a very dear friend of Bob's, Mr. Dick. Van Patten. Mr. Mr. Cummings, I am such a fan of yours. This is such a thrill for me to be here tonight because I think back and you had me sitting on the edge of my seat in the picture Saboteur directed by Hitchcock. You had me crying in King's Row and you made me laugh my head off in a picture, I think the funniest comedy ever made, The Devil and Miss Jones. Uh, You two can do it all. I think that you and Cary Grant are probably the greatest comedic actors that were ever on the screen. I really mean that. The exciting thing tonight was that I'm such a fan of Mr. Cummings all these years, and I always wanted to be a friend, but I don't know, really know him that well. But when I came in and I talked to you and you knew who I was, I said, my gosh, she watched me on TV. That was a real thrill. That was the icing on the cake. Thanks a lot, Mr. Cummings. There's one person in this room who um, you appeared in your early career on her radio show first. Uh, she was a child star. She went on to vaudeville as a headliner. Nightclub, she's still regarded as one of the greatest nightclub performers ever. She did movies in television. We still enjoy her uh, in the reruns of the Dick Van Dyke Show. We laugh along with her marvelous wit on the Hollywood squares. Probably the oldest friend of yours because she was just a child when you were on her show. I'm speaking. <laughs> <laughs> but I came out here, and I was basically a nightclub performer and singer and uh, doing theater and stuff like that. I had never really done any television to speak. And uh, I was called in one day to uh, do a part on the Bob Cummings show. It seems that the girl that they had wanted to use, I uh, believe her name was uh, Freeman, Freeman. Catholic, uh, Cat Kathleen Freeman, uh, was sick. And they called me. I had a name with the writer. Dick Wesson was one of the writers of the show, and Paul Henning, who was the genius of the show. But uh, Dick Wesson called me, he says, can you do the Bob Cummings show? I said, I I'd love to do it. And so the first day I went in, and I'm so thrilled to meet Bob Cummings, and oh God, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and we did the first scene together, and he came over to me, and he said, I know you since you've been four years old. <laughs> I said, well, that's very nice. Thank you very much. And he said, you are a little too broad on camera. <laughs> Theaters and, and, and at this point, I'm ready to listen to anything because I wanted to do television, you know, do episodic television, dramatic television. And I said, well, well, what? She said, just keep it down. Just keep it down. He says, not too much Mickey Mouse. <laughs> and he said, and he, he said that. So then we do a scene and he'd say, you're covering your face. I said, where? Where? Uh, uh. He says, there's your light. Oh, there's your light. He says, you're covering your face. You're talking to me this way. Talk to me this way. I said, okay. And every time I get a little broad, he'd say, Rosie, make a mess. And I know what he meant. And I will remember to the day I die. I am very grateful. You have helped me so much, Bob. And I love you. And I wish you the happiest, happiest birthday. And I hope you have many, many more. And for God's sakes, get a better caterer. Ah! We have a lot of cameras going tonight. Who would 
believe that one of the men operating the video camera would be a man who, not only one of the most marvelous voices of all time, a marvelous screen personality, but I have to believe also one of our great producers, because if it wasn't for Alan, there would be no Jack Jones. Yes. Would Alan Jones come up and say a word? Mr. Jones, leaving his camera. <laughs> And there's a song. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There isn't a comedy team that didn't make a living for many, many years thanks to your wonderful song. Thank you very much. Stinky, I'm delighted to be here for your wonderful birthday. We did a picture together. I had uh, story approval, cast approval, director approval, and the producer came to me and said, no, we have two young men, a comedy team, and I'd like to introduce them in your picture. This is three days before we started to shoot. And I said, uh, who's that? He said, I'm Costello. I said, where are you going to put them? He said, well, well there was one routine in the casino. So I said, fine. So we had fun doing it at the end of the picture. Uh, my director called me, Eddie Sutherland, and said, uh, have you got cutting approval? I said, no, why? He said, uh, they've cut the picture to hell, and they put seven routines of Adam Costello. So, <laughs> we went, Bob and I went on a banana boat to Central America, and we were in Cologne, and uh, we went by a theater, and they're on the marquee, and had Adam Costello in the night of the tropics. No mention of us at all. <laughs> but it was so much fun making the picture, and, and subsequently our friendship. I've always treasured Stinky. It's good to see you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is for you.
tell the story of when you had asked me to do your Bob Cummings show. Well, dear Gussie, I was thrilled out of my mind, naturally, because I've always loved him very much and was such a fan. And when Paul Henning asked me to his office, I didn't know what it was about. I had the clue in Hades. I really didn't know. And uh, so he said, We've, we're going to do this show with Bob Cummings. I said, fantastic. I can hardly wait to see it. Who's going to be in it? He said, you are. I said, what? <laughs> wait a minute. What, what, what do you mean? He said, well, we wrote this part of, of Schulze for you. I said, for me? Oh, you've got to be kidding. Dear Gussie, I haven't worked in two babies. And uh, he said, well, no, really, truly, we, we wrote this for you. I said, but what you don't know is that I've got three here. I'm expecting, and there's no way in Hades I could do a show. And I said, besides, I stopped all that so that I could have my, I wanted five children, which of course God has blessed me with five since then. And I've got five oh, besides the two, just five in total. But I think one of the greatest thrills in my life was just to know that you wanted me. And one of the biggest disappointments in my life was that I couldn't do it. But I said, wait a minute, gentlemen. There is a lady. I don't know her name. I don't know her name, but I see her every every Saturday night at the Macombo. She comes and she does this great dance routine with a big tall gentleman. He's fabulous too. I don't know her name, but I swear to you, I'll bring her to your office Monday morning. So sure enough, I could hardly wait till Saturday night. That was Friday. Saturday night, I headed from a combo. There she was, dancing up a storm, doing just a great routine with Richard Deacon, who worked with Rosie. I later found out. And the lady, of course, was the fabulous Ann B. Davis. So I went up to her and I said, lady, this is no joke. Honest to God, it's the truth. I don't play jokes on people when it comes to getting a job. And I said, there is the most wonderful role and the most marvelous gentleman that I would have had the privilege of working with, that I've always been his number one fan. But they're doing a new show called The Bob Cummings Show. So I said, Bob Cummings? I said, yes, the Bob Cummings. So anyway, I brought Chelsea or Andy Davis in to see you. And it's like a fairy tale story, but it's the honest to God's truth. And I'm so tickled because I said, she is Chelsea. This, I think God really created this role just for her. And it worked for everybody. And she couldn't be here tonight. I know you told me as soon as I gave you a bear hug tonight that you talked with her this afternoon. She wanted to be here with all of her heart because she loves you with all her heart. But I know that she sends her love and kisses to you as I do and everybody here in this room. It means so much of us to share this special moment with you. You brought so much joy to the world for such a long time and we care so much about you. God bless you for all you've done and thank you very much for letting me show you. Bless you, James. Yes. <laughs> we finally, Mr. Henning, had them on camera together. Look, we've been talking about Paul Henning. Why don't we have the creator of the Bob Cummings show come up and say a few words? Where is Mr. Henning? Paul, are you here? You see. He's looking for the salad. <laughs> He's looking for the salad. No, several of the people are headed. Bob. I have to take one card out particularly, because this shows you the, the magic of your love and kindness. This is a man that only has known you personally for about a year, but at four o'clock this afternoon, a gentleman that we called very early on uh, to attend the party, and he was very devastated that he couldn't be at the party, and then he called personally and we talked for 40 we talked for 40 minutes and he said that on this night he has to uh, have a particular auction that bears his name and if he doesn't show up as i guess most of you know in the room in your various charities you have to be there whether you want to or not because that's what sells the tickets and he came by today drove 50 miles all I know is I was working with Sid Color on a little number that we want to do uh, in tribute to you, and my son-in-law said, there's a man that wants to see you. This man drove all the way from, uh, well, it was Orange County, just to deliver this because the mail would be too slow. I'll read it. And you all have only known him, Bob. You've been fans of one another for many years, but you only met just a short time ago. He personally delivered this, and I think that's an example of the, the love. Uh, I, I shouldn't have opened this a little range. It says, Dear Bob, in 1960, 
Mr. Ed and I moved into your old dressing room. We filled your room, but we could not... Oh, listen to this. We filled your room, but we could never fit your shoes. Happy birthday, God bless, and we love you, Alan Young. Delivered personally today at 4 o'clock. Personally. Here are some others, Bob. Uh, this one here is, is from, well, I'll put it this way, a little hint. Well, we're going to see the USA. Thank goodness she taught us to see the USA. She wrote a kind of a funny thing. She has a picture, as you see this here. She said, and the caption, which is written in the card, says, Happy birthday, stud. <laughs> she says, Love to you and Janie. I copied this down. That's why, because uh, I had a little difficulty reading. Love to you and Jane, Janie. I wish I could be there to help you celebrate. All we'd need would be Gale Storm, and we could fall backward over the bench, off the bench, love Dinah. Yeah. Love Dinah. This here, dear, well she writes this to me, and there's something back home, that's why we have, but we'll, we couldn't bring that in here. We got some surprises for you tomorrow. Well, I'll tell you, Shirley MacLaine called and was on the phone for 45 minutes apologizing that she couldn't be here tonight. And I think I could say it now. She couldn't call you at that time because you didn't know that this was happening tonight. But tomorrow you're going to receive a special message and a special little gift wishing her dear Bob a happy birthday. That's Shirley McClain. Uh, she wrote this to me. Dear Jimmy, thanks for the invitation to Bob's birthday. birthday. Unfortunately, I won't be able um, uh, uh, won't be able to, to attend, uh, but we'll try to call him sometime that day, which she means Samari will get a call, because she has your phone number now, and she didn't want to tip uh, uh, off the party. She said, but I won't give a hint about the party. So, oh, so I was wrong. Uh, please give him my love. I've always been so fond of him. Thank you, Ann B. Davis in Pennsylvania. This here, uh, dear Uncle Bud, now this was probably the hardest letter anyone had to write because this particular person, you're going to be receiving the lyrics to a song that we're going to close the program off with, uh, and you'll see that I say special thanks to uh, people like Mr. Sid Culler for writing some special material for this evening, uh, for Marty Farrell for helping me with some of the introductions that I never got to use because uh, several of the people uh, uh, had to leave. And, and, and at any rate, but I said, dear, I used the adjective dear in front of her name because she helped so much with this party. She said, hi, first of all, she wrote a letter to my wife and I, delivered by Federal Express, and she was devastated she couldn't be here. Hi, Uncle Bob, we are so very sorry we cannot be with you on this very special occasion. I am particularly sorry because I wanted to give you a great big kiss to see if I could still make smoke come out of your ears. <laughs> anyway, happy birthday, and with tons of love, from Uncle Bill, uh, from Uncle Bill, and the good for nothing redhead, Julie Bergen Bishop. Julie Bishop Bergen. Julie Bishop. I, I have to say this one thing. Julie's lovely daughter, I had the pleasure of being with Bob in Phoenix in 1968. I was appearing on Central Avenue at a club that no longer, by the way, most of the places I worked are no longer anywhere. Uh, but I work the Horace Hype room. He lets me come in in the daytime, and I feel like I'm in show business. You know, little, little thing. At any rate, I had the pleasure of watching, Bob, I had the pleasure of watching you direct Generation, and you starred in that show, and you were introducing a young actress who uh, I managed because we were off Tuesday nights, and the Tuesday was the opening. I had the pleasure of being there opening night, and she delivered a superb performance. At the end of the play, Bob came forward, and after the curtain calls, he said, you know, he said, I've been in show business most of my life. He said, and we've heard that adage, the show must go on. He says, and maybe 
that isn't applied as much as we would like to believe it is. But he said, I saw an illustration of that tonight because our lovely star, our lovely star received news yesterday that her dad, General Shoup, had passed away. She flew back home to be comforting to her mother and then the following day, because she knew the show had to open, she came in to do this performance. And it was a just a magnificent performance. And I'd like to, at this time, have her maybe say a word. One of our finest, finest actresses, and what a dear, dear person, Pamela Shoup Sweeney. Pamela, would you say a few words? Pamela! Oh, well, that's amazing. You just really took me off guard. That was an amazing night um, for me, yes. Um, my brother, Steve, uh, and I lost our father when I was doing Generation with Uncle Bob in Phoenix. And we flew home for the funeral. And Uncle Bob, you were one of the pallbearers. And I'll never forget that night as long as I live. Um, coming back and being on stage with Uncle Bob was, it was an incredible experience because I had known him since I was, what, four days old, maybe? Something like that. My best friend in the world was Melinda, who was his eldest daughter. And we grew up together. Our families were very, very close with the Linkletters as well. And I spent all of my youth learning how to swim in their pool and playing in their backyard, and it was just a great, great um, childhood. You were a part of my childhood memories all my life. And when I was on stage that night, it was so easy to call you Daddy, because you were playing my father, and it was just a lovely feeling, and it made it much, much easier, because it was you who was there on stage with me, and you were part of me becoming an actress. You were part of my desire to become an actress. And I thank you for giving me that, for the wonderful memories of you and Mom on stage, and for all the beautiful memories um, from the time I was a very, very little girl. And I love you and I love your whole family, and you will always be very, very dear in my heart. <laughs> Happy birthday, Uncle Bob. to daughter Melinda, Bob, Patricia has two videotapes from Melinda and her whole family wishing you a happy birthday that you'll be able to take home afterward and be able to see them. And also from one of the others. You come right up here. This is Patricia Goldhammer, Bob's lovely daughter. Pat. Yes. tonight. One lives in New Jersey and one lives in Michigan. Um, but they, they've um, made some adorable videotapes um, that I think will be just a wonderful thing for you to see, Daddy. And we all just want you to know how much we love you. And um, children, they entertain you with many birthday songs. It's very special. Uh, we, we also, uh, uh, I'm going to continue just a couple of these. This is, is a letter. Regretfully, we had a previous engagement uh, on, on the night of the party. Please convey our deepest good wishes and congratulations to Bob and the gang. And tell Bob uh, he'll have to go like hell to catch up. Signed, Betty and Bob, Mr. and Mrs. Robert Young. Yeah. <laughs> we have, dear Bob, congratulations and hang in there, Eddie Albert. Yeah. 
This man I talked to 45 minutes two days ago. He was devastated, but he sent this telegram. Dear Bob, I am so sorry I cannot be with you, but I am sending my fondest wishes and great affection to a great guy. Happy birthday, Donald O'Connor. Yeah. Oh. Happy birthday, dear Bob. I so wish I could be there at your party, having a dress rehearsal for the big show June 15th. If not for that, I'd be there, tap shoes and all. Happiness always, you're one of a kind, my kind. Cut to a wonderful day, Peggy Ryan. Yeah. In Las Vegas. Dear Bob, I am so sorry I can't be with you tonight to give you a great big kiss and hug on your idiot, but I'll be thinking of you and wishing I could be part of such a lovely evening. Your friendship always meant so much to Ken and me, and I feel so fortunate to have such happy memories of the wonderful times we spent together. I'm looking forward to more of them, but in the meantime, send my love and wishes for the happiest of birthdays. Betty Lou Murray. Betty Lou Murray. Dear Janie, this came to Janie, I'm so sorry that I cannot be at Bob's surprise party, but I will be on the East Coast. He, by the way, is receiving an award in Washington this evening. Thank you so much for the invitation. Please give my best wishes to Blade. You know who I mean. Give my best wishes to Blade, and I wish him continued health and happiness. Love, Milton. Uncle Milton Miller. This here is from the man that you were partners with in your show uh, on television. Dear Bob, by the way, I'll give you a hint. A the Haven. Da -da 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 -da. He's appearing tonight in Atlantic City and feels terrible that he can't be here. I'm speaking, of course, Mr. Burns. Dear Bob, so you're now 80 years old. When I was 80, I had Cupid's eczema. <laughs> Is that funny, Doc? Or maybe I didn't. I can't remember that far back. Anyway, happy birthday, kid. And when you're my age, maybe we'll do another show together. Love to you and Janie. George. That's of course Mr. Burns. See, this may look like a little letter, just a couple of lines, that's what makes him the great comedian, but he called, he was so devastated, he said, what can I do? He says, I promised them they sold tickets, I gotta be there, and yet I wanna, he says, I show up at places I don't even wanna be when I'm back home, but I wanna be there. So I said, well, Mr. Burns, let's face it, you are God, and you can do anything. And he said, you really think so? And I said, why of course, Mr. Burns, remember this. You are, to all of us, our higher power. And so he pulled some strings and he sent us a replacement. Ladies and gentlemen, George Burns' replacement as only he as the great one could do. Gosh, Bob, in your day when you did a love scene, 
You kiss the girl and they cut to the waves pounding at the seashore. <laughs> I mean, they're doing love scenes in movies today, Bob, that you and I wouldn't do in our own bedroom. <laughs> Even if we could. <laughs> uh, listen, I saw a movie the other day. A young fellow takes a girl for this long drive out in the country, stops the car and said, gee, I, I just ran out of gas. She said, oh, that's okay, I still love you. And then they get romantic. Now, to me, that's not love. Real love is when you're romantic with your own wife in your own bedroom, and halfway through you say, honey, I just ran out of gas. And she says, that's okay, to me, that's love. Now, if you know something, Bob, listen, I, when I found out it was your birthday, I decided to go out and, and get you a present. I shopped everywhere. Kmart, pick and say, couldn't find a thing. So I, I suddenly remember, Bob, about, I think it was in 1947, you borrowed $10 from me, and you never paid me back. So for your birthday, Bob, you can keep the $10. Well, the only thing I ask, Bob, is you pay the interest, which is $11,483.12. And but by the way, I, I, I've got to compliment you. You are phenomenal. You know at 80, you look better than me at 39. Am I right? <laughs> And, and I know it's due to your, your enjoyment of, of health and your knowledge about vitamins and, and exercise. In fact, you may not remember this, Bob, but years ago, my wife Mary came to see you. This is true. She came to see Bob, and they were chatting about something. She said, Bob, I'm, I'm not too thrilled with my bus line, and I'm thinking about getting one of those, you know, enlargement things. And he said, Mary, don't do that. You don't need it. Half of it is exercise. The rest of it is in your mind. He said, take, take a weight in each hand, and every day at the same time, do Mary have a little laugh, which please was white as snow. If I do this every day, my bust is sure to grow. Isn't that silly? But it was working, you see. So one day she's in the supermarket, and the, that checkout line was so darn long, so she parked her basket, it was time for her exercise. She found an empty aisle, grabbed a couple of cans off a shelf, and was doing, Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow. If I do this every day, my bust is sure to grow. And as she's exercising, this guy is staring at her. He said, hey, did you learn that from Bob Cummings? She said, how would you know that? He said, hickory, hickory, <laughs> feature the deadpan song stylings of this particular artist, you knew that you were watching a movie from the wrong studio. She, well, she just recently closed at the Palladium in London. Five weeks they saluted the MGM musicals. She's not going to sing tonight, but I think she'd like to maybe share with a couple of words the very lovely Miss Virginia O'Brien, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Jimmy. My dearest friend, Jimmy Caesar. And Bob, what am I going to say? Your dear wife, you're the one. I knew all of them. 
<laughs> Remember uh, when uh, you and I were on that uh, on the road with uh, the Luana Parsons junket? Hey, and my mom, you know, she looked after me, and you and I used to run around on some place in Baltimore. It was snowing and all that. Then when we came back, almost to Los Angeles, you had your little uh, uh, what do you call those things? A, a, a little room. And you made the bed down, and every two minutes my mom was knocking the door. What are you doing? <laughs> anyway, that was so true. I love you, Bob. We didn't do anything. I wish we had. God bless you. <laughs> I love you, dear man. What a what what a talent. And it isn't just the uh, the TV shows. You are a talent, and I. Would you help me a little? But I bless you and your dear wife Jane, and God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Well, Miss Virginia O'Brien, ladies and gentlemen. John. By the way, I have to tell you something about her appearance at the Palladium. They had Catherine Grace and they had Tony Martin, Sid Charisse, all of the MGM stars. However, they held over one artist. And she packed the theater every night, and that is the one, the only, Miss Virginia O'Brien. Love you, Virginia. Very good to see you. I was going to introduce a lot of people before I introduce this next man who is probably Bob's oldest and dearest friend. Um, and I was going to introduce, in fact, Marty Farrell wrote me some wonderful introductions. I didn't even get to use a good of that. Oh no, I think I used one, maybe one introduction. Uh, however, I can only say that this man, uh, and I'm, so I hope you'll forgive me that I'm not introducing, because just about everybody in the room is, <laughs> I'm, in, I'm shaking because I'm standing next to them during the party, Jimmy. At any rate, uh, this man, Probably the closest friendship. He he taught me, and I say I learned that that uh, I was just one of millions and millions. He he taught me that 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 we as kids say the darndest things. He taught us that people are not maybe as bad as they are. They could be funny, and he showed us how they were funny. He uh, he told us that we could have a house party every afternoon and we could join in and he would invite all the big stars into our house. I remember you, however, Mr. L, from a movie that you made that I must have seen 75 times. It's one of the funniest comedies and I laugh even if I think of the scenes. It was Ronald Coleman, it was uh, Vincent Price, Celeste Holm, and this man who was brilliantly hilarious, in fact, it paved the way for the $64,000 question that came on TV shortly after. Ladies and gentlemen, the movie was called Champagne for Caesar. Now, why do I remember the title so well? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Art Linkletter. Art If you want to know the funny part of the picture, Champagne for Caesar, <laughs> it was that I was a young would-be actor, never having made a picture before. I was doing some shows. And in planning to do this part, Ronald Coleman, and Vincent Price, and Celeste Holm, all pros, all great stars, told me that this picture was such a surefire hit that they weren't going to take big salaries, but just minimums, and we were going to share in the net <laughs> net proceeds. When I say net, I, I get a wave of sympathy up from the audience because all of you have done net pictures. And we made the picture, and that's what we got, our minimum salary, net. The picture never paid any money to anybody. Really? The producer who built three private homes, three swimming pools, and 11 trips around the world. However, I am delighted to be here because, of course, Bob and I go back to when we were both uh, young performers having children, and we were among the most productive of all the stars. <laughs> there was hardly a day that we didn't meet each other and say, what's up? And, of course, <laughs> it always was. 
and move very rapidly without sounding like a maraca with the pills inside of it. I stand here full of diuretics, never, never allowed to be more than 32 feet from the men's room. No chairs. My patron saint is June Allison. <laughs> <laughs> However, this has been a lovely evening, not just because of Bob, which is the highlight, the creme de la creme for me, but seeing so many of my old friends, people I've interviewed. One, I don't know who he was, but I did enjoy him when he's coming in. White haired pot-bellied old gentleman shuffled over, recognized me, and said, I was on your show when I was five. <laughs> and I was just going to do that. But other than that, it, it's been kind of like a 50th anniversary of a high school reunion. Who the hell is that? He just kissed me. <laughs> but Bob, this I say sincerely. Make new friends, but keep the old. Those are silver. These are gold. New made friends like new wine. Age will mellow and refine. But friendships that have stood the test of time and change are surely best. Brow may furrow, hair turn gray, but friendship never knows decay. For mid old friends, tried and true, we once again our youth renew. So cherish friendship in your breast. New is good, but old is best. Make new friends. Keep the old. Those are silver. These are gold. Thank you. Wow. This, is this a special evening? Is this not? I'm talking to Jack Rourke a moment ago, who's produced just about every great thing we have on television. And I said to him, I said, Jack, this is really something. I've got, I got Captain Midnight over there, Richard <laughs> Webb. I've got, I had Gloria, the, the talking to Gloria Jean. And one thing I've always felt, MGM had Judy Garland. Universal had Miss Gloria yeah. Jean. Gloria, I know you're out there somewhere. Dear Gloria Jean. Over here, Gloria, please come up here. Thank you. Miss Gloria Jean. Lovely. Lovely. Thank you. Bob, I was a very little girl when I first came out here to California. And I made a movie in 1939 called The Underpup. I was very frightened. I didn't know really much about anything. The one man that helped me the most was Bob Cummings. Yeah. He took me under his wing and kind of gave me, showed me the ropes, gave me tips and what to, how to act and what to say. I'll never forget it, Bob. You're just too much as far as I'm concerned. And standing in this room tonight, I have to say, that everything is great today in the industry, but the days that I remember are days, Bob. And everybody here in this room, there's nothing in the world that will ever compare with it. I love you, Bob. Happy birthday. And I'm sure you all agree with me. Thank you. Miss Gloria Jean, ladies and gentlemen. I have to do this, I because there's two people here that um, some actresses you watch through the years leave you with a feeling they have the world in their hands. But this lady, she was always so vulnerable. You felt, you felt that she'd just fall apart. She made you believe and care. It simply boils down to this. She's a hell of an actress, Miss Marsha Hunt. Yeah. Marsha, would you say a word? Miss Marsha Hunt.
55 years? Does anybody go any farther back than that? <laughs> the year was 1935, and I was 17 and newly out here. And in my very first picture, Welcome to Hollywood, I had a leading man named Robert Cummings. Uh. First picture. Well, it may have been your first, too, wasn't it? It was your first picture. <laughs> it was the first one you remember. All right. We did four together at Paramount. And I want you to know that Bob played neurotics, troublemakers, um, tenderfoot, almost slapstick comics in our first Western, and a young murderer headed for the electric chair, I think it was. And uh, what was the fourth one? Oh, we played opposite each other, finally, in um, Hollywood Boulevard, when they brought back a dozen or more of silent picture stars. I remember that Bob had more energy than anyone I had ever known. And he kind of energized me. He had a focus to his work and a kind of inner motor that was racing and that was electric. The camera caught it, you, the fellow workers caught it. Bob was magic and so versatile and such an actor. I think he was a premature health nut. <laughs> Before we knew about vitamins, he did. He was a vegetarian. He had his own airplane as soon as he could afford it, and you know what he named it? Spinach. <laughs> I brought along some stills, Bob, that I dug up from those four pictures. And if this weren't quite so crowded a party, I'd make you look at them tonight, but we'll find <laughs> another time. It has been the most beautiful thing to watch all that talent flower and bloom, and to see it shared with a television audience as well as a movie audience. I think the the fondness we had for each other as we worked together stays exactly the same, even though we haven't met for decades. But it's time we did again, and now we're neighbors. We live on the same street. So you come over to my house, and I'll show you all those old pictures. <laughs> Here's to the next 55, and may they be as good as the last. Who made a monkey out of mighty Joe Young. The very lovely Miss Terry Moore. Terry. I'm the only one that showed up for your party last Friday, so this is the second time <laughs> that I've attended it, and I was there all by myself. <laughs> Bob and I made a picture. I can't believe it. I never knew I'd live to be 41. 41 years ago, it was called The Barefoot Mailman. And I took my first trip to Florida. Mom and I, we made this movie, and I just admired him and looked up to him so, so much. And one thing you taught me, that acting begins with the feet. And, and also, I remember you had to use a cane and gloves. And you were, the entire, during the entire production, you were never once out of character. He carried that cane, he acted with it, he had timed every word to that in the gloves. Do you remember that, Robert? He was so exquisite in this role. And I remember two other things. It's funny, when you work with people like Robert Cummings and Tyrone Power, and these Ronald Coleman and these t stars, these great, great, true stars, and you're a very young teenager, you never forget the advice they give you. And three stories I remember. One story, I remember that there was an actor, I hope he's not here tonight, <laughs> that he uh, was always upstaging Bob, and he finally took out a handkerchief. And during the, during the scene, put this down, during the scene, he would wave this handkerchief. And he would talk to Bob and he would wave it. You know, and of course, what are people going to be looking at with this white handkerchief? So Bob, being the veteran actor he was, he just went like this. Where was the handkerchief <laughs> where Bob went? <laughs> Do you remember that, Bob? And I know you taught me something, two other things. He, I was very 
shy. I was being upstaged by a lot of the other actors. Bob never would. And um, he said, just remember, if they keep upstaging you, he said, turn your back to the, ca to the camera. And, and the, then the cameraman, because I couldn't ever say anything to anybody, and he said, then the cameraman will notice. And I've always done that about when I was upstage. I'll never forget that. And then one other thing that you've probably forgotten, but you told me, of course, we were back then in the 40s, 49, when people didn't discuss sex that much and it wasn't the open education it is today. But he said, remember, Terry, and I was still a virgin at this time, he said, no matter whom you're ever with, you never tell that man that you ever had an affair with another man. Always keep it quiet. He said, even if you marry somebody, never admit that you went to bed with them. <laughs> well, Bob, I'm still a virgin. <laughs> Thanks to you. <laughs> I love you. Oh, Miss Terry Moore, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Great, Terry. Just as lovely. You know, Helen Flores was here earlier, and so was Penny Andrews, and we wanted to uh, at least do a chorus of the song that you... Do you know this? That Bob, a uh, hoe, is this... Did I do that? Uh, I don't know why I worry. I carry a built-in echo chamber. <laughs> and I get a few... Hold on a second. Yo, we're on. This yeah, is yeah, Gregory yeah. Peck. <laughs> said, well, oh, it's back. I worked with a partner, Bob, my first few years. I was just a teenager, and I was playing in vaudeville, and he never let me near the mic. Never let me near the mic. They, in those days, it never came off. You know, it used to come up off of And so I learned how to do loud impressions. <laughs> loud to everything I did. Why, this says John Wayne. Well, just one minute there. Because I never was on the mic. <laughs> that didn't work, but I didn't plan it, so... You gotta give a guy risk factors. Uh, Penn, we have we were going to do a song. Many people may not realize that Bob introduced one of the greatest songs I know I've ever heard on Broadway. Now Helen Forrest, dear Helen, uh, she we all know that she's not been in the best of health, that she was here for an hour and a half, that Patty Andrews, I assumed, would happen. So what do we do in situations like that? We call upon the hardest worker for this whole party. Believe me, she never stopped. Janie will verify this. See, my, my wife, Val, was a musical comedy singer when we met. In fact, she performed in Hello, Dolly. And she said, oh, no, Jimmy, I'm not going to sing. No, no, I don't want to sing. But, Val, you have to do the number. You have to do it. My lovely wife, Val, where is Val? Because it's the song that Bob introduced. Here she is. I don't know what happened to the lyrics. I don't know what happened to the lyrics. But what I'll do, see, I was going to do the verse. I lost the lyrics. I'm lucky I have even the notes I've got there, Lois, because I've been running back and forth to get things. At any rate, I'll just do one line of it. Hi. Remember last Friday, oh, or was it yesterday, uh, I was... I was rehearsing a song. I, I know the lyric is all off. I apologize, Bob. But how did that song go? Oh, yes. Yes. I, you found him in the Aloha room, right, Bob? <laughs> That's how we tricked him to get here in the Aloha room. <laughs> he came looking for me in the Aloha room. We were going out to dinner, the four of us. I like the likes of you.
every day because they live right next door to one another and this man well he probably wrote most of the jokes that we hear he was the top writer on the Colgate Comedy Hour for Eddie Cantor he did all the material the Ritz brothers ever did Jackie Gleason Bob Hope ladies and gentlemen the distinguished Mr. Sid Culler Sid you've got to share some words with us still waiting for the main course <laughs> I have never been, have you got your script? I, I was looking for it. You know, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen. Uh, Bob's daughter got up in the red dress and gave a eulogy. How do you follow an obituary? <laughs> I, I, I lost my part. Did you bring yours? I got mine, yeah. I'll read off for yours, can I? This is what you call organized thinking. <laughs> Did I, that might be it. What did I drop? Thank you. 
of late, but this show was so long and the dinner was so late that I wrote it. And I got put you in the spot. And uh, Jack, I think you know the tune, I told you what the tune was. And, uh, you ready? and I think you can do it. Ah, this is especially written by me for you. And it's going to reflect, I think, what we all feel about you, Bob. And I think Jimmy will do it well. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Bob, words cannot express the happiness that, that I have had these past few years uh, since we've become buddies and pals. And uh, I recognize the song. The music is by Jerome Kern. The lyrics by Mr. Sid Keller. I think B flat is right. Of times when we watch TV like a fantasy, suddenly we see an image of you just the way you are tonight and you're so handsome with your smile so cute in your three-piece suit there is nothing for us but to love you just the way we do tonight with each glance your friendliness grows touching folks near and far and dear Bob the universe knows you are our favorite star Robert never ever change Keep that boyish charm. Won't you please arrange it? Cause we love you just the way we do. Springs, and I said, Del, you wrote the song, 
that was the theme of the Bob Cummings show, A Romantic Guy I. And he said yes, and I said, I'm trying to get a copy of that song so I could learn the lyrics for the party. And he not only sent me a copy of it, Bob, he signed one to you, and I in turn sent him a couple of episodes of the Cummings show that Jamie so kindly gave to me to make a copy of. And so Del Charbet, who couldn't be at the party, he uh, let us use the song, Sid Color, borrowed some, not, he, he took the concept of Del Charbet and just changed it to fit you, Bob. Now I'm going to sing the first chorus of this song. I'll sing it all by myself first. You'll get used to the melody, and then please join in with me in one chorus of the song. Before I do this, how about it for the fabulous Mr. Jack Nye at the piano? Jack, thank you. Mr. Pat Moran on the drums. And Mr. Vic Vignello on the guitar. So I will do, I'll do the first chorus, and then you'll know the melody and you'll be able to come in. A romantic guy, Bob. Hail and hearty guy Bob is so high in the sky and he can't deny that his love Janie is the reason why Unpedantic by far A gigantic star Bob is A triple threat he stays green and TV
Okay. <laughs> Daily news. What was happy birthday to Bob? Happy birthday, Bob. Happy birthday. And over here we have Tonia and Anthony Caruso. Yeah, you can say Tony. It's all right. Tony Caruso. <laughs> happy birthday, Bob. We love you, right. And Dolly Brown. And I see Ellen Jones. Marjorie. Great Marjorie. night. Great night, Bob. Oh, a special night, Bob. Oh. Right. Did you guys enjoy it? Oh, we had a great time. You did a good job. He hasn't written the script now. I don't know what to say. Did you guys have a good time, huh? Yeah? It was a wonderful party. Yeah, praise God. You can turn it on. Yeah, really. Thank God. Now you can turn it on. Yes, you can.